in truth, like technology in the insurance sector is, is driving innovation beyond the insurance sector. It's driving innovation across multiple sectors. Well, if there's one topic we in the UK are never short of having an opinion about, it's the weather. Could be why flood insurance has, unlike many areas of the world, been automatically included in insurance cover in the UK for a long time. But of course, flood risk itself is a problem everywhere. And there are big changes in the US now with the NFIP. That's the government backed national flood insurance program, which is looking at new ways to rate risk. But it's also opening the market up to insurers to offer alternatives to what until recently has been quite a restricted market. Well, many successful companies have been spun out of universities. And as you're going to hear in a minute, the founders of Fathom started with a research project at Bristol University. They're now building flood models around the world and they count leading insurers as their clients. Matthew Grant here. And if you are one of our regular listeners, you'll know that we aim to make these interviews relevant to everyone. And whatever your background, this is another one you're going to enjoy. If it's your first time, well, a big welcome. Please do let me know what you think when you get to the end. And if you do like this, then you're certainly going to find more great guests in our back catalogue. Stand by for Andy Smith and Ollie Wing, who will be guiding you through the latest developments in flood modelling and what they're up to. Don't worry if it sounds they're going to start drifting into some technical talk at some points. I'll jump in, so to speak, in a couple of places and explain just what's going on. Ollie, Andy, really looking forward to hearing about this flood is such uh, I don't know if you can call it a hot topic for such a wet, cold thing, but it's definitely something of interest to a lot of people just now. Fathom was formed back in 2013. You came out of the University of Bristol, where you were doing a research project. And your mission, your stating is to give more detail, or the most detailed, I should say, accurate and comprehensive flood risk data covering the entire planet. It's a great and grand ambition. Uh, I also, you started with modeling in, in the US, which is also quite a bold move. We'll talk more about that shortly. And you're now moving into UK and Japan. Andy, you're one of the founders. And Oli, you're the chief research officer. And you joined in 2016, another alumni of Bristol. Welcome to you both. Hi, Matthew. Great to be here. Hi. So Andy, a bold move to uh, been out of a university project and start a company. What was the motivation for doing that? Well, the motivation was actually the insurance market. So uh, luckily, I, I sat next to uh, a gentleman called Chris Sampson in our PhD office. Uh, we were doing quite similar topics for our PhD, so both uh, building computational flood models. And Chris's PhD was, was funded by um, Willis. And through those connections, we began to engage with the insurance market. And it was uh, the insurers who were telling us that the things that we were developing um, from an academic perspective were actually really interesting to them. And indeed, um, some of the bolder ones said they, they would even license the models um, if we made them. So that's what really kick-started it. And Oli, for you, so I mean, you left university, but this, that stage, Fathom was a pretty early stage startup. It's quite a career choice to go and start with a really early stage company. And what was it for you that gave you the confidence to go and join Andy and Chris in what they were doing? It was quite a natural progression in many ways. I studied in the research group that Fathom spawned from, and indeed, Fathom directly funded both my PhD and my postdoc. So there comes a time in, in an academic's life where you generally have to make a conscious choice between going into industry or remaining in academia. But with Fathom, you could do both. I mean, the research output from our little company at the time rivaled or frankly exceeds most universities studying this sort of thing. So I never had to make that choice. I could have the best of both worlds here. Can we start off, first of all, just with a definition of what the different types of floods are and how should people think about the impacts they can have uh, from an insurance perspective? There are a number of ways in which uh, an asset can, uh, can get wet and get inundated. Um, the, the primary forms of flooding that insurers are interested in, because they are the most frequent forms of floods, are, are climate-driven events. And these are um, principally flash flooding, where you get really intense rainfall over short periods of time uh, running off over the land surface. Fluvial flooding, where rivers drain, fill up, and then overtop and flood uh, surrounding floodplains. 
and coastal inundation. And coastal inundation um, can be uh, things like extreme tides or even storm surges from, from things like hurricanes. It's the climate-driven forms of flooding that, that Fathom principally focuses on. There are other uh, mechanisms for flooding, things like tsunamis uh, and, and even things like dam breaks. We, we have undertaken some um, kind of preliminary efforts to do some dam break scenarios, but principally we were focused on, on the climate-driven forms of flooding. Given the high resolution you need to model floods and the fact that you've got three different types there anyway, I mean, you actually got quite enough on your hands to Stephen tackling those three different areas. Uh, and it'd be helpful just to understand from the, cl the client's perspective or the insurers that are working with you, what do they actually get from Fathom that they're using to make decisions within their businesses? So in the insurance market, it takes two principal forms, really. Um, the first is, is hazard information. So Fathom provides hazard layers. We can provide hazard data anywhere in the world. So we provide hazard information to insurers, but we're also now building um, cat models as well. And, and cat models move from hazard through to plausible event footprints and indeed vulnerability. So transforming the hazard into an estimate of loss. And then we use the Oasis financial engine as well. So instead of just hazard, you get an estimate of loss out of the end of the cap model. Okay, let's just back up a second here. So Andy is talking about cap models. Now that's short for catastrophe models. And these are the sophisticated tools that insurers have been using for about 30 years now to model major losses from hurricanes, earthquakes, and now floods. Catastrophe models are required for events that are large and infrequent, and they can't be modeled using normal actuarial methods. Now, the financial engine that Andy mentions is the part of the model that takes a physical loss, like a flood, and works out what the financial implications are going to be for the insurer and the customer, i.e. how much are they going to lose or, in an insurer's case, pay out. We're going to discuss this a little bit more in our next chat. You're moving into that probabilistic space, and you mentioned Oasis, and come back again and talk a little bit about the platforms you use. But you know, and rather to Ollie's point earlier on, you're taking the benefit of being able to access research data, really understand the flood hazard model, but they're actually then also linking it up with other partners so that you can provide that to insurers in a way that's relatively easy for them to consume and use in their uh, business workflow. Yeah, indeed. I mean, flood models are very difficult things to consume. It's uh, it's kind of a nature of the peril itself. It's it's very spatially complex, so the models can become uh, very large and, and, as I say, difficult difficult to consume. So um, we do um, work with partners like Nasdaq to make the models uh, really really easily accessible. Well, let's just keep going on that theme then. So, your Nasdaq provide their risk modeling for catastrophes platform. You and I spoke at one of their events back in July last year on flood modeling. They certainly have been quite successful in moving ahead, at, you know, allowing companies like yourselves to actually get out into the insurance space. But can you just talk, talk a little bit more about how do you work? You, know, you mentioned Oasis and with NASDAQ and other, other platforms out there that for people who are using the models, they can you know, get a combined package of yourselves and the providers. The Oasis framework, I guess, is, is, is the key to all this. So Fathom um, are a team of flood risk scientists at heart. So we know how to build flood models really well. The thing that we, we don't have experience of uh, until a few years ago is, is, is how to build CAT models and, and how to build um, the kinds of infrastructure that insurers need to, to get the answers that they want. Um, the Oasis framework provides that for us. And that's, that's really key in, in enabling us to build CAT models. And, and people like NASDAQ now are providing platforms with which Oasis can be easily consumed. And, and really, um, truthfully, NASDAQ um, and the platform they've built will be key to us providing cap models to the insurance market because our models, as I said, are, are very large. Our US model, for example, is, is over a terabyte in size. So um, providing that model in a quick uh, and easy to consume way um, is very difficult, but, but NASDAQ are achieving that. And, and I think will be um, a key to our success over the next few years. They're doing that with quite a few different organizations we both know, both in flood and uh, in earthquake modeling and, and wind storm modeling as well. So coming back to the US, and in my introduction there, I was quoting your mission or your vision for the business of you're looking at flood for the entire planet. I mean, the US, as you said, is, is a 
is big, it's complicated because it's flood, really difficult to get right. Can you just talk about you know, how have you as a relatively small company managed to build a model that you've got confidence in and clearly because you've got clients using it, you know, the market has got confidence in uh, at a level of where you need a lot of detailed resolution. I mean, there are no shortcuts with flood modeling. So what sort of techniques and approaches have you taken to be able to release a model into the US? Well, I guess that speaks to the heart of our philosophy as a, as a modeling organization. So in the beginning, the thing that we set out to try and achieve was to build models, not just of the US, but of anywhere in the world. Um, we wanted to be able to build models of the whole planet. Um, if, you, if you want to do that, then you have to change um, you have to change your perspective with how you build these models. Going out and building models in a kind of um, a a local way or an engineering type way where you're you're spending a lot of man hours building specific parts of a model. Um, You're just never going to be able to achieve a a comprehensive model um, of somewhere like the US and and definitely not the whole planet. Um, The best kind of evidence we have for this is the FEMA flood hazard catalog. So FEMA have been trying to build comprehensive models of the US um, for decades and they've spent billions of dollars doing that. I think the latest estimate is over $10 billion building these small scale models across the US. Our frameworks are in in many ways semi-automated. So the models kind of build themselves. Um, They're designed to be deployable anywhere in the world. It's just that the the accuracy of the models and the precision of the models improves where we have better input data sets. Our focus on the US was actually kind of um, driven by two things really. Firstly, it it was clients telling us that they wanted models of the US, which truthfully in the beginning surprised us because we thought our our kind of USP in the beginning would be building models of really hard places to model. The other benefit of building models in the US to start with is that it it provides a really great place with which to test these methodologies. There's lots of data sets in the US to validate the models and check that they are actually um, accurate. Our latest validation exercises um, really do indicate that our models are accurate in the US. We can largely replicate data sets that have cost billions of dollars to produce across the US. And and, and Ollie in particular is focused on um, validating the models, not just from a hazard perspective, but also from a loss perspective as well. Well, validation is clearly really important. So Ollie, we'll pick that up in a second, but just wanted to continue with that theme of the US. And you mentioned... FEMA and many of our US listeners will know what's happening in the US with the NFIP or, or the National Flood Insurance Program and your FEMA has been providing some of the risk rating to them. But there's been a big shift, hasn't there, in how the US government through the NFIP is looking to open up flood insurance into the uh, the more commercial markets or into the, the insurers other, uh, as well as being a government uh, offering. Uh, Oli, can you talk a little bit about you know, what you're seeing happening out there and how that's driving interest in the model in the US? Well, the NFIP has historically been an insurance provider managed by the government. And, and if it were a if it were a private organization, it, it wouldn't be solvent. And so in, in recent years, it's opened up to the private market. The, the regulations are if you live in a flood zone with a federally backed mortgage, you have to get insurance. And Historically, it's only been provided by the government, but now the private market can step in. They want to actually accurately price that insurance, not using um, data that that is quite severely limited in terms of its coverage and scope in the US. So a new model with with complete coverage of all rivers, for instance, offers a step change in understanding of US flood risk that the private market can use to inform the high rate of penetration that we hope will now happen. High rate of penetration? That simply means a large number of people starting to buy insurance in the private markets. Certainly seeing a lot of of change out there and actually no surprise that people were uh, asking you to help with modelling because up until now there have been very few choices for credible flood models in the US. Well, congratulations for, for cracking that area. I think if you can build a model for the country the size of the US with the complexity and resolution down to one meter, you can probably build a model for anywhere. So you're well on your goal to covering the entire planet. Uh, and Ollie, whilst, whilst I've got you, i also like to talk a bit about validation and vulnerability modeling. So yeah, hazard is the flood itself, but of course, it's also very important to understand what happens when 
the water ends up going through the front door of a building or impacting it in a different way. So can you talk a bit about how you build vulnerability models and, and what's important to consider for a vulnerability model when you use it alongside a flood hazard model? As flood scientists, we we love to focus on the physics of the problem, but that translation into economics is equally as important uh, and perhaps doesn't always receive as much attention as the physical modeling itself. But you can have you know, a, a meter resolution, the fanciest flood model in the world. But if you don't actually know how that impacts losses to buildings, then uh, it, its relevance for insurers is, is questionable. So we try to put as much attention into how we model the economics, the vulnerability of this problem as we do the physics. And uh, our academic ties are really what enables that. Previously, the, the prevailing source of information for informing flood vulnerability in the United States is from the US Army Corps of Engineers and, and the Federal Insurance Agency over there that have developed depth damage curves. Now, these are fairly poorly documented. We don't know much about how they were derived, but what we do know is they're at least 30 years old. Um, the, the prevailing curves were developed, drawn from a few data points in the 90s, really, against a few flood events rather than making use of the, the full breadth of flood insurance information, principally in the form of claims that we now have access to. Now, there was a recent release of FEMA insurance, National Flood Insurance Program claims data open to all, but it was redacted. There's, there's a lot of quite crucial data points missing from that open release. What we've had access to through our academic ties is that fuller database, which also contains measures of flood depths. So with, with two and a half million data points from the claims that have been made across this program's history, we can actually understand empirically what the impact of flooding on building losses is and essentially construct depth damage functions, vulnerability functions directly from that. Okay, just going to jump in again here. So what Ollie is talking about is the really important aspect of building any insurance model, and that is understanding the real loss experience. Now, building the physical hazard model, in this case, flood, is only half the challenge. But understanding how flood then damages buildings and causing financial loss is the essential second part. Now, these are the curves and vulnerability functions you're about to hear about. Getting access to real claims information from insurers is really important, but it's getting harder. Few insurers these days are willing to provide this information, at least certainly not for free. And not sure if you just caught what Ollie said there, but Fathom had access to information on two and a half million claims records. Quite impressive. And the things that we found are, are really quite surprising to us. We, we generally find that the traditional curves provided by the Army Corps, for instance, systematically overestimate how much damage shallow floods can do. So models based off of those will generally report a higher risk than, than the empirical data would suggest. And the other point that we found is that the relationship between flood depth and damage, even for similar types of buildings, is enormously variable for a number of reasons that we, we don't understand in many ways, be it due to lack of data or lack of process understanding. A metre of flood water in a one-storey residence for, for event A could be wildly different to one for event B or in location A versus location B. So rather than essentially besmirching that uncertainty by having single deterministic functions, we say embrace it, model that explicitly. That, that uncertainty is part of the risk and that is what we want clients to understand. Yeah, it's a really really important part, isn't it, that uncertainty, because you know, whilst everybody would love to have certainty in life, you know, the, the more sophisticated users of models and the actuaries and those others actually are, you recognise there is uncertainty, but they want to be able to understand it, model it and use it. And and there, is it just you're talking about that, it occurs to me, is there a difference between the you know, different types of flood? You get somewhere you've got standing water for for days, whereas maybe a flash flood just goes through and it's gone. Is, is that impact the vulnerability between how long the water's around for? It does, yes. And and we see this again borne out in the empirical claims data, which which is nice. It's, it's, it's not very often that you find data that more or less perfectly fit intuitive physical reasoning. But from our own research, we're starting to see that systematically coastal floods of a given depth because of their perhaps their velocities and, and their, their salt water content are more damaging than fluvial floods, which in turn 
are more damaging than, than pluvial floods, which are generally more transient and involve more clean water in essence. So we start to see a lot of fairly intuitive variability on that front. And what about globally? Because if for windstorms and earthquakes, there's obviously a big variation around the world depending on where there's occur in the building stock. But it seems to me that maybe that's not so, such the case with flood, in, in, in which means it's slightly easier to expand your flood models globally. Or are you also starting to see regional variations in vulnerability? Well, frankly, it's a, it's a question we'd love to be able to answer. But as in, in many problems flood, flood related, uh, the, the problem is data scarcity. So the US, you know, to the point as to why we build flood models in the US, one of the reasons is because there's so much data there, you can actually build excellent flood models because of all the claims information we have to define vulnerability, as well as all of the, the physical flood modeling variables like, like river gauges and terrain data. So that really enables us to produce a very advanced flood risk model of the US. When it comes to the global question, we, we simply haven't got much data on you know, the difference in vulnerability between the states and Africa or all the states and Southeast Asia, there, there just isn't the data to underpin that. Um, and so it's certainly something that is not going to be addressed anytime soon, but can, <laughs> as, as insurance penetration expands across the world, hopefully claims are collected in a way that will help us inform that over the coming years. Yeah, and presumably also from the academic point of view, people are starting to look at other areas as well. So you've got, you've got that as a resource. Uh, well, that was really, really helpful. Thanks. So, Andy, coming back to you, just talking a bit about the early days of the business. I know Google was one of your early clients. Can you talk a little bit about you know, what got you off the ground with Fathom? You know, to the extent you can share what you did with Google, that'd be really interesting to know. Uh, and then the other sort of non-insurance clients you had, and we'll talk about the insurance clients in a moment. In the early days, uh, we, uh, we started out really um, working on projects for the World Bank mainly, so building models in, in really data poor areas. Um, and, and then we, we did indeed get some grant money from Google, um, who, who essentially um, gave us some grant money to work on in a platform that they had called uh, Google Earth Engine. They recognized that we were trying to build something, what they thankfully deemed to be quite um, innovative and cool. And um, they gave us a, a sizable grant to, to basically explore those ideas. I, I will say we also got a, a grant from the UK government and specifically from the Natural Environmental Research Council in the UK. And, and they gave us, again, a sizable grant that, that allowed us to really sit within the university, explore our ideas, try and build some prototype models and engage with the insurance market. And it was that funding that really... Um, I, I guess served as what's traditionally called kind of seed round funding for, for new companies. So we didn't have to spend our time going out trying to sell the idea of Fathom to, um, to fundraisers. Uh, we, we just focused on building the technology early on, thankfully because of those grants. So um, yeah, a, a big thank you goes out to, to both organizations. It's a choice, isn't it? You get the grant money. Uh, you probably don't have quite as much money from investors but it gives you a bit more control over the company and then at some point you can then come back and get investment but you've already as in your case you've got clients you've got revenue it puts you in a much stronger mm -hmm. position so i think you know some recommendations for people listening who are thinking about how they start their company off if you can get those grants and get some clients in early it does certainly put them in a much stronger position and then from your point of view you know really good to see that you've got a number of well-respected well-known companies working with you who are who are willing to share that fact publicly. I mean, so often I hear companies who are working with insurers who, for whatever reason, don't want to disclose who they are. So I'm hoping we said that you can now reel off the long list of names of companies that I've got sitting in front of me uh, that you can share about what you're doing with people in the industry. The insurance market is really important for us, still our principal focus. And, and thankfully, um, e even early on, organizations like Canopius uh, were willing to, uh, frankly, uh, take a bet on us, us producing good data sets. And, and we've had a long and fruitful relationship with Canopius over the last few years. Um, but our insurance clients now are, are growing all the time. So we work with people like Canopius, um, Hiscox, uh, Aon, Sompo, Chaucer, and more are joining. Very quickly as well, I think the really encouraging thing that we've seen in the last few years is that the demand for these kinds of data and these kinds of models goes far beyond just insurance. And, and that's intuitive really i mean the data that we produce are 
interesting for anybody interested in climate risk. So we see now that the demand for what we're producing um, is growing all the time. And we license data to a range of organizations across multiple different sectors, whether that's um, large corporates, um, Microsoft, for example, license all of our global data and use it for internal exposure management. We license all of our data to organizations like the World Bank, um, and, and they have a global coverage from Fathom. We license data to engineering companies um, who use it for kind of quick screening of sites. Uh, and, and we're even now beginning to work on, on forecasting models. So we've recently been working with the UK government and providing um, rapid response to events as and when they occur. And, and those, those data are used by emergency responders on the ground. Oh, that's an incredible client list. You know, congratulations on that. And some big household names that you know, both, I'm sure, give people confidence that what you're doing is you know, amongst the best models to use, but also a you know, great opportunity for, for growth and exposure. And you mentioned sort of in passing there, Aon as one of your broker clients. And of course, for those people that aren't sort of aware of the significance of the brokers, having them as an organization that's working with you is really powerful because often the insurers look to the brokers you know, both to run the analyses for them, but also to advise on which companies to work with. So you know, both a great client to have, a great group to market, but also you know, really good to see an organization that is, is supporting you. And, and then just picking up on that, in the, I'm guessing, what is it, seven, eight years now since you've been running the company uh, and, the, and you and Chris and your colleagues, what recommendations or advice would you give to other people that are in the early stages of building companies uh, that you've got from your experience? One simple piece of advice would, would be uh, get some advice. Uh, so we were really lucky in that um, after we left the university, we moved immediately to uh, a tech incubator space. And this is, this is an office environment that not only provides you with desks, but also provides you with all of the support uh, needed when you're forming a company. So lots of workshops, lots of kind of hands-on advice from, from successful entrepreneurs in the building. Um, and, and that was really important early on because fundamentally we were flood scientists and we had, we had no idea how to form a company, how to build things like uh, build a board and, and, and all of those things are really important. I would think I would stress more than anything, just focus on the technology. If you, if you focus on building good products, um, then, then they will come. Uh, and that's what happened with us early on. We didn't really focus on anything else aside from building really good models. And when we built really good models, we ended up getting um, good, uh, long-lasting clients. So focusing on the technology is, is I think, um, the most important take-home point. I agree. The technology is, is really important. I guess it's what might, maybe the Harvard Business Review might say is uh, necessary but not sufficient. You still obviously got to find something that works with your clients, which I think is why the link with NASDAQ and some of the other platforms you're using is so important because you've got the technology, but you're also finding a way to deliver it to your clients. I've asked you a lot of questions and just to make sure before we're getting close to wrapping up, is there anything we haven't talked about that either of you would like to, to add in what you're doing or what's going to be happening in the future? The point we've been making throughout this podcast is that being able to interact with this data is, is in many ways just as important as producing it. We, we could have remained uh, academic researchers building these awesome flood models publishing them in, in world leading journals and the data just being just sitting there and not being put to use. So the fact that we commercialize this product and, and the, the existence of the Oasis loss modeling framework and other companies who then essentially bring that to life is, is a crucial step. It's all very well producing these models, but you've got to get that data into the hands of people who can actually make use of it. And so that's what partners like NASDAQ provide. Yeah, and actually also worth adding, you know, NASDAQ is not just providing a, a really strong platform, but they themselves have got really high standards of who they work with. So you know, in addition to mentioning the brokers, you know, they've got some you know, very talented people, you know, Matt Jones, uh, who, who's been building and running models for years. So that in itself is another endorsement. I think it's a very nice sort of loop between the technology availability, but also that kind of validation. Um, well, good. And, and we're delighted to have you as one of our recent corporate members for Instec London, uh, and we've known each other for a while, but it would be just great to hear what uh, led you, you know, it's still as an early stage company where your money is really important um, to actually committing to join us as a corporate member. We'd like to have you on board and 
interested what lessons there might be for anybody else in your situation. We're delighted to be partnering with you, uh, with you guys. So I, I think uh, in truth, like technology in the insurance sector is, is driving innovation beyond the insurance sector. Um, it's driving innovation across multiple sectors. And, and I think that's particularly true in, in, the, in the catastrophe modeling world. So understanding physical perils. Well, it's, uh, it's no great secret that lots of other sectors are really playing catch up with the insurance market um, on, on, on that front. Instech are, are great in that you guys are providing a showcase for that innovation. And it's great for us because we can keep up to speed with what's going on in the insurance market. But also it gives us the opportunity to tell others about, about what we're doing as well. So um, yeah, great, great to be partnering and, um, and yeah, keep up the good work. Thanks. Well, I mean, on part of that, we're just in the process of wrapping up our location intelligence report as we're talking. It may well be out by the time we go live for this podcast. So that's an opportunity for people that are interested to know yeah, across the full range of what's happening with identification of locations and hazards. And we're talking more about what you're up to in there and, and also how you fit into some of the workflows. So a really good opportunity on that. And then you know, things looking up, we might even at this point be able to, uh, to get you to come down from or along from Bristol to London and stand up on stage and actually see some real people again and talk to them in the flesh. That will be a bit, bit hairy initially, but I'm sure we'll all <laughs> remember what it, what it took. Yeah, let's, let, let's hope it's not, not too long away. Fantastic. Well, Andy, Ollie, many thanks. I'll let you get back to building the models. And yeah, so let's hope we see each other face to face before uh, before too long. Thanks, Matthew. Great. Thanks, Matthew. There you go. Another company making a tricky topic sound relatively simple. If you haven't already discovered our podcast section on the website, then that's where you can get more information on all the companies we're talking to and our edited highlights written up for you from the interviews. What could you ask for? Now, if you're building a great company that is shaking up what is happening in insurance and risk management and want to find out how we can help you with what we are up to at Instec London, please do drop me a line, Matthew Grant, either on LinkedIn or email hello at instec.london.